Jenny Offel is the author of the novels Last Things and Department of Speculation, which was one of New York Times Book Review's best 10 books of the year. As one of Department of Speculation's biggest fans, I could not wait for weather to come out, and I was not disappointed when I read it. Literally finished it last night. Our protagonist, Lizzie, a university librarian and graduate school dropout, is also a wife, a mother, and a sister to a recovering drug addict. She's also an assistant to her mentor, who hosts a doomsday podcast called Hell and High Water. Written in her signature style of scenes as vignettes, little slices of life reported just the way we live them, this book chronicles the end of the world at the hands of climate change. Weather is smart and funny and emotional with just the right amount of paranoia to make it utterly relatable to all of us. Some of my favorite praise for the book includes Ocean Vong, who said, this is so good. <laughs> Which is true. Uh, we are not ready nor worthy. Um, Sheila Hetty said, dread, the sensation of sinking, lostness, and being cast away from any sense of safety infiltrates every interaction and private moment in this book, like ashes from the burning world, Awful describes. And finally, Gia Tolentino, who said, no one writes about the intersection of love and existential despair like Jenny Awful. <laughs> Moderating tonight's event is Dan Kois, an editor and writer for Slate's Culture Section and a contributing writer for the New York Times Magazine. He is also the author of How to Be a Family, which we have, of course, on sale here, um, which is a memoir that chronicles the year he dragged his wife and kids around the world to find a stronger sense of family and togetherness. So please help me welcome Dan Coy and Jenny Offel. Hi, thank you guys so much for coming, and um, sorry to be late. Um, it's very exciting to have a quote from Ocean Vong on my book, and slightly hard to live up to. Um, the part where it says, we are not worthy. You may think, I think I'm worthy of this. Sure, why not? Um, I'm going to read a little bit from the beginning of the book today, um, and that's going to include the epigraph because I'm someone who loves wandering around and uh, I, think I, I think I spend a good year or so imagining what the epigraph of my book is going to be just because that's sort of a form of procrastination. So this one I found um, in A History of the Puritans. Notes from a town meeting in Milford, Connecticut. 1640, voted that the earth is the Lord. Let me start over. Notes from a town meeting in Milford, Connecticut, 1640, voted that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Voted that the earth is given to the saints. Voted that we are the saints. In the morning, the one who is mostly enlightened comes in. There are stages, and she is in the second to last, she thinks. This stage can only be described by a Japanese word. Bucket of black paint, it means. I spend some time pulling books for the doomed adjunct. He has been working on his dissertation for 11 years. I give him reams of copy paper, binder clips, and pens. He is writing about a philosopher I have never heard of. He is minor, but instrumental. <laughs> minor, but instrumental, he told me. But last night, his wife put a piece of paper on the fridge. Is what you're doing right now making money, it said. The man in the shabby suit does not want his fines lowered. He is pleased to contribute to our library. The blonde girl whose nails are bitten to the quick stops by after lunch and leaves with a purse full of toilet paper. I brave a theory about vaccination and another about late capitalism. Do you ever wish you were 30 again? Asked the lonely heart engineer. No, never, I say. 
I tell him that old joke about going backward. We don't serve time travelers here. A time traveler walks into the bar. On the way home, I pass the lady who sells whirling things. Sometimes, when the students are really stoned, they'll buy them. No takers today, she says. I pick out one for my son, Eli. It's blue and white, but blurs to blue in the wind. Don't forget quarters, I remember. At the bodega, Mohan gives me a roll of them. I admire his new cat, but he tells me it just wandered in. He will keep it, though, because his wife no longer loves him. I wish you were a real shrink, my husband says. Then we'd be rich. My brother's late. And this, after I took a car service, so I wouldn't be. When I finally spot Henry, he's drenched. No coat, no umbrella. He stops at the corner, gives change to the woman in the trash bag poncho. My brother told me once that he missed drugs because they made the world stop calling to him. Fair enough, I said. We were at the supermarket. All around us, things tried to announce their true nature, but their radiance was faint and fainter still beneath the terrible music. I tried to get him warmed up quickly, soup, coffee. He looks good, I think, clear-eyed. The waitress flirts with him. People used to stop my mother on the street. What a waste, they'd say. Eyelashes like that on a boy. So now we have extra bread. I eat three pieces while my brother tells me a story about his Narcotics Anonymous meeting. A woman stood up and started ranting about antidepressants. What upset her most was that people were not disposing of them properly. They tested worms in the city sewers and found they contained high concentrations of Paxil and Prozac. When birds ate these worms, they stayed closer to home, made more elaborate nests, but appeared unmotivated to mate. <laughs> but were they happier, I ask him? Did they get more done in a given day? <laughs> the window in our bedroom is open. You can see the moon if you lean out and crane your neck. The Greeks thought it was the only heavenly object similar to Earth. Plants and animals 15 times stronger than our own inhabited it. My son comes in to show me something. It looks like a pack of gum, but it's really a trick. When you try to take a piece, a metal spring comes down on your finger. It hurts more than you think, he warns me. Ow. I tell him to look out the window. That's a waxing crescent, Eli says. He knows as much now about the moon as he ever will, I suspect. At his old school, they taught him a song to remember all its phases. Sometimes he'll sing it for us at dinner, but only if we do not request it. The moon will be fine, I think. No one's worrying about the moon. Thank you. You know it's a good bookstore when they bring you wine. Usually I feel I have to drink white wine so that I won't spill on myself during the reading, but because I have decided to wear red, it feels like it won't be that big a disaster. I'm sorry, everyone over here. I feel like I have my back to you. I'm gonna sort of, it's like that teaching thing where, you, where you're teaching and then all of a sudden you're like, these people over here could be frowning all day and I have no idea. You could stand up and walk around like a TED talk. I maybe. could, I could. Yeah. I once went to a wedding where, um, it was kind of funny because my husband had never been to a, um, a Christian wedding and he thought that this was the way all Christian weddings were, but it was actually like, turned out to be like a super evangelical wedding. And not only did the bride promise to love and obey for the rest of her life and he was just sitting there and I was like, but then at a certain point, the bride grabbed a microphone like this and she did begin to walk among us singing a song from a Disney movie. It was really one of the best moments 
I've ever experienced at a wedding. So whenever I'm given this kind of microphone, the part where I want to be like, ah, but I will, is, I will spare they, you. We do that at all Christian weddings. <laughs> do you? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, That's I've standard. been to a, I've been to a lot, but this one this one also with your goodie bag, you got some you got some Bible verses. So it was. Uh, uh hey. Hi. Let's just keep. Riffin. Riffin, yeah. Um, thanks for writing a really great book, in addition to the two previous great books. Thanks for coming. Um, so how are you enjoying your book tour for this book about uh, uh, climate fear in the age of coronavirus fear? Um, oh, yeah. Well, I did, w I did attempt to wash my hands like a surgeon mm -hmm. before I came over here. Um, I don't really understand the part about how you're supposed to... Uh, watch under your nails. Does anyone know how to do that? But I did. You I did use the backs of my hands. Use your and, other nails. And I sang "Happy Birthday" twice. Once. <laughs> You're all gonna die. Wow. <laughs> um, yeah. That, and then um, I, I, uh, my my daughter is having a moment of fear about my traveling with the coronavirus. She asked me if I was gonna wear a mask, and I said because I try to model science-based understanding. I was like, well, they really don't think that the mask... She was like, could you just wear one for me? And I was like, oh, no. So They're unavailable in stores. Are they? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't get them now. Uh, oh, we have them because we're preppers. <laughs> That's right. You have, <laughs> you have 25 gross of masks. <laughs> no, not really. Uh, I mean, so you do talk a little bit... You have talked a little bit about how for, a, a, for maybe a, a brief period of two years or so, you became that person who at every party would talk a lot about how you're prepping and mm. the masks you bought. Um, you know, as I, I sort of think of this kind of scare that we're in the middle of now, this coronavirus scare, as a kind of like training wheels version of the climate change disaster that is upcoming. Um, but you've been thinking a lot about this for the last few years. Do you think we can learn anything from these kinds of experiences, from this coronavirus scare, from other moments where we come face to face with Oh, maybe this is it. Probably it's not it, but maybe this is it. Is there is there learning that can happen, or is that are we way past that? That's so funny. I thought Dan was joking when he said we were going to talk about the coronavirus, but I'm kind no. of excited that we're going to. Um, I think that if there's anything we can learn is maybe just um, how to tolerate uncertainty, because that's what happens with the climate crisis as well. That we we really don't have a handle on what the effects are going to be and where they're going to happen. And there's a sort of slow motion disaster feeling. Um, I do feel like it's a little bit hard with this particular possible pandemic not to feel like you're in the flashback scene of the movie about the pandemic where you're like making a joke about it or noticing like one person wearing a mask and then flip ahead. So I feel like um, trying to remember that actually um, we, we don't know lots of things. But this, when I was studying sort of disaster psychology for writing this novel, it just turns out that dread particularly accumulates around any kind of danger where, one, we feel like it's not fair that this unlikely disaster would happen to us, and two, it's something where you have almost no agency in preventing it. Right, and this is a little bit the opposite of a climate disaster because I do think people th people feel as though, oh, if I do everything right, if I say sing happy birthday twice mm -hmm. while washing my hands, like I probably can avoid this thing. And in that way, it's different from, from climate disaster in that there's nothing you can practically do. And in fact, focusing on the individual is like the opposite of what actually needs to happen. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I think for years we've been told that we, we can, oh, here are the things you can do to prevent disaster. And I mean, we've all read those 50 ways to green your house uh, lists or bought your light bulbs or done whatever. And, um, and the part where it turns out that some of that was actually funded by um, <laughs> cl climate change denying uh, corporate entities is, is disturbing, to say the least, because I think that the wish, of course, is to convince people that they can only act individually, that they can't act collectively. Because in general, whenever there's been any kind of progressive change in our country, it's been through collective action. So I do think, though, that in general, I will just 
I won't speak for all humans, although I want to, but as a human, as a novelist, that's as a human, right. I feel that I often am thinking, oh, if I just do this one thing, I won't die. I'll just do this thing. And then that will, that will mean that I won't die or suffer some other terrible thing. But, but I think that's sort of maybe why I am a writer, because I'm not at all good at convincing myself. I feel like the people that breeze through life and we all know them and we sort of admire them they're almost never writers um and they don't ever think they're gonna die they just they, they think like oh uh, what are the chances of that and you're like it doesn't have to do with chances it has to do with like the evil eye looking down upon you <laughs> right it has to do with that's kind of science-based thing i like to bring yeah, up. yeah. Well, well it has to do with narr narrativizing right you yeah. talk about we always it's hard not to feel like we're in the flashback scene of the movie right that mm -hmm. at some point during this reading someone in the back is going to cough and then we'll all Look at them, yeah. and then we'll flash forward ten years to us all like in the camps. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that that is what that is what writers do, right? Is but but it's interesting to me the way that this book uh, fractures and complicates that idea of the narrative, the, the very familiar narrative of disaster. And it seems like Lizzie is trying to um, to sort of fight her way past that, past the tricks that her brain keeps playing on her. Um, and the way that the narrative is fractured seems like, seems like an attempt on your part, at least, to start to think about different ways to think about the narrative of upcoming disaster. Um, I know that this has, has often been your mode, the, the sort of collage mode that you've worked in. How do you think that it particularly was useful for this story that you wanted to tell? Um, well, for those of you who haven't um, seen anything I've written, I write in these often quite short paragraphs, and there's space around them. Um, and the reason I do that versus in a sort of linear, continuous thing is that I'm often trying to figure out how to write and have something working on on two different scales at the same time. So I feel like, especially when it comes to um, concerns about climate change, um, we're often one minute imagining uh, something about how, say, all the um, subways in New York are below sea level. Um, or at the next minute, you know, we're just picking up aluminum foil and picking up our kid from school or doing all these ordinary things. And that sort of ability to swing back and forth, all of us are quite good at. Um, and part of what I was interested in trying to do in this novel was what happens when it becomes less easy to do that? Um, I read this book uh, a while ago when I was first writing the novel called States of Denial, which is a book by a sociologist, and it's, like it says, about different kinds of denial. Um, I think I've sold exactly zero of them, although I bring it up at every reading, because the subtitle is Looking Away from Suffering and Atrocity. <laughs> it's just not like an easy sell. I love um, looking away from yeah, suffering Yeah, I mean, I was like, all right, yeah, bring it on. I'll look, I'll look far away. But he talks about this idea of um, how, in a lot of places, he's particularly talking about um, apartheid era South Africa where he was from but that there is a kind of twilight knowing where you you know on the one hand that things are very uh, terrible but you're also if you're lucky enough not to be immediately affected there's a lot of sort of glancing away from it or not putting it under a, a full light to look at and so I wanted to sort of write about what it would be like if you became less and less able to do that Right, it's like uh, it's like Ram and Ram, right? You you sort of put the the feelings of existential dread are are a constantly running program way in the background. Mm. But the book is about how they how it starts like interrupting the actual everyday right. day to day. And that's when I became the bad dinner guest. Right. But it was more like I was like uh, more like I was like bad in the with the fellow mothers who would say something like. Oh, you know, I, I really think it's going to be important for our, our children to, you know, learn Mandarin because I think the economics in uh, China is going to be really, it's going to become really important. And I'd be like, archery. I think you should learn archery. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> and, uh, and usually it would just kind of be like a little blip, like they just kind of be like, what? <laughs> um, but I would be thinking to myself, oh, you know. And then at one point, the the movie, what was that movie where someone hun Hunger Games, and um, my daughter, who at the time was nine. Uh, she was like, I think I might like to to do archery, and I was like, great. And then we bought it, and then and then it just sits in our it sits in our corner, waiting for the apocalypse. When I'm sure we're going to use it with great skill. Oh yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, my cousin's daughter lives in Haymarket and is a world-class teen archer. Oh, wow. So when so it all goes down, we're befriend, driving yeah. to Haymarket. Yeah. Uh, so let's, I want to talk about stand-up comedy with you. Um, are you still a big Maria Bamford fan? Oh, I love Maria Bamford. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, when I first met, uh, I met Dan, well, I guess it was only once, but we uh, were talking about um, if there was anything I would maybe be interested in writing about, and I'm not much of a nonfiction writer, I only really write fiction. And they said, anyone you'd want to interview? And I was like, Maria Bamford. At I worked time, hard to make it happen, but failed. Yeah, well, then Rhea Bamford, her star just began to <laughs> rise and rise and rise. Um, but I have, uh, I am a one, one woman evangelical team for her. If you haven't, if you haven't seen her, you might want to watch the shows where she, and this is based on a real life occurrence. She had a nervous breakdown during her comedy tour and she moved back in with her parents in Minneapolis or St. Louis or something. And there's a whole thing where she performs in her home imagine it, doing the voices of all the people that she went to school with and that she now sees and her own parents it's quite fun uh i mean in some ways the among the many things that the forms of your books remind me of are our stand-up routines right there's you you riff on a topic for a little while then you get out before the topic is exhausted and then you sort of try to gently ease us into the next one maybe with a segue maybe abruptly but they often end in laughs um, they're often understated. There's like a, maybe like a Stephen Wright vibe to some of these riffs. And I'm curious if you have thought about uh, going to like an open mic. Oh, oh, good Lord, no. no. Come on. <laughs> I mean, I guess it would be um, one thing about doing stand-up comedy that would maybe be interesting is that you would sort of know immediately. If you, when you're writing a book, <laughs> you, you would know like, oh, that... No, no one likes that at all. Like when you write, when you write a novel, you're sort of like uh, I find that I, uh, I just for several years. This one took about like six, six and a half years. So for those six and a half years, I just swing back and forth between grandiosity. Oh, I'm so glad that I am solving climate change through my words alone, and then like just horrible self-loathing, uh, and and trying to quit the book completely. Sometimes applying for other graduate school kind of situations even though I'm far too <laughs> far too you think I'm joking but I often I receive things in the mail that I realize I, I, I wrote at a slightly manic late night phase that I have uh, tried to see if I could become a, a linguist or something despite having no aptitude for that right with novels it takes six or seven years to know if you're bombing but let's yeah see, let no know I mean right I think away. I'd know yeah. right away yeah. right um, it's funny to read from this novel in different places because um, the uh, the joke about the antidepressants goes over really well in the cities. <laughs> Less so in like a well, little local town near mm. my, at the library. There's a lot of like, what do you mean? Unmotivated poor, to mate. Those poor birds. Yeah. Uh, you're good friends with uh, Lydia Millet, yes? Yes, this book is dedicated to her. She's an excellent novelist and short story writer. If you haven't. Tell us a little her. bit about what her work has taught you as you've been writing over the years. Um, well, the main thing about Lydia, Lydia has been my friend since I was in college. Actually, we weren't friends in college, but we, we knew of each other. Our, our little joke is that, um, uh, she was, I became more pretentious and she became less pretentious and we just met in the middle. At the time I thought she was, um, just extra, I mean, I don't know, her dad's like an Egyptologist and she spoke like three languages and I was just coming from Charlotte, North Carolina, um, barely making it through UNC Chapel Hill. But she, um, what she mainly taught me was that it's not boring to write about political things or to write about um, really, she mostly writes about extinction, but also just uh, on a broader spectrum about environmental issues. And um, so a lot of this novel, the idea for it came from years and years and years of talking to her and um, she'd sort of tell me these really interesting doomy facts that like any good depressive I would file away oh that seems very terrible very interesting very interesting and then um, but I at a certain point I realized I just I knew all these things but I, I didn't feel it at all I just thought about it and so I was interested in kind of once I did take a look at the science I was like why don't I feel what this means, you know, and that was part of building a character in a world to sort of see where the emotion would be in it. 
Um, if people want to line up at the microphones, I've got one more question, and then it will be your turn to ask questions. Uh, I guess there's a microphone. Sometimes just one there. Okay, so line up at that microphone. Um, re a reminder that your questions must be in the form of questions. They may not be statements. Um, all right, last question. Um, in uh, Parle Siegel's uh, profile of you in the New York Times Magazine, she it was full of wonderful details about your writing and your life, but I thought the most crucial thing in it was its revelation that you have strung up in one room in your house a clothesline with unmatched socks on it. <laughs> yeah, it's and called then the you, sock refuge. They, they called the sock refuge, and then you keep a score sheet of who in your family has mm. joined the most socks together. Yes. Who is winning? Uh, well, sadly, morale has fallen. <laughs> uh, it was it was a sort of exciting, uh, you know, my daughter favors, you know, socks with sloths on them or socks with Frito Kahlo. On them. But then we just have only one of them and they're very distinctive and they're very sad. It's a, it's a feeling of, of loss. And so I, I instituted this thing, which is you know, possibly the only organizational thing I've ever instituted in my own house. And it was very exciting for a while. Uh, she was ahead, then I was ahead, um, and then it just stopped. But the other day, I, I quite readily marked that I had put two together and went out and announced it to really incomplete indifference. So <laughs> it was, uh, you know, it was, it was a hard, it was a hard re-entry from life on the road to not be heralded for that moment. Yeah. Uh, all right, no one's at the mic, so I get to ask you another question. Um, there's this line that Sylvia says in the book, um, the one that really hit me the hardest. Uh, Do you really think you can protect them in 2047? Then become rich, become very, very rich. Yes. Uh, so what can we all do about that? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it's funny, not that many lines from my conversations with Lydia um, made it into the book, but that's one of that's them. That's straight from and Lydia. And I remember <laughs> when she said that, because I, you know, she's been doing this for so many years that, and I was about two years into reading about this, and, and one night we were, uh, we were out to dinner, and I just sort of, after three glasses of wine, was like, uh, I think you know a secret I don't know. Like, where should we, where should we go? What should we do? And. And the look on her face was like as if I had, she had taught me well until this point, but the part where then I was just falling for the thing where it's only about your own, uh, your own little clan and about no one else. But she said, yes, become, become very, very rich, which I have so far failed to do. And yeah. also um, I see now why she was saying that. Um, the rich too will be affected though, although it'll take longer, I guess, when they're in their bolt holes and in New Zealand, there was that really astonishing article where they asked, have you ever read Douglas Rushkoff? Did you read that thing? Mm -hmm. So for those of you who haven't read this, I, I recommend it as a deep dystopian dive, in, but nonfiction. Um, so Douglas Rushkoff, who's often considered someone who's kind of a futurist and can advise you on various things like this. So he was called to some meeting of extremely rich people and they it turned out what they wanted to know was, okay, we've got the compound, okay, we have all the stuff, we've got our whatever, we've got our whatever. How do we keep our guards and servants from turning against us? <laughs> do you think some kind of collar that has like a special lock that only a few, and, and he was like, well, I, I think you should, you should be very, very kind to them so that they regard you as family. And, and apparently they all just laughed. Like, <laughs> what a crazy idea. Um, we saw so, a parasite. That doesn't yeah, work. Yeah, parasite doesn't work. So, yeah. Uh, all right, we have a question right here. Hi. Hi. Um, I uh, also read the New York Times art um, review, and that's what caused me to read both of your books in like a couple of days. <laughs> Yay. So I'm here after only knowing you for a week. Um, <clears throat> and... One thing that impressed me about the article was the fact that you put fragments on the poster board and that so many of them get discarded. And so after reading two of your books this week, I became quite addicted to your little fragments and how it appears as if your brain's very associative. And so I went on like Twitter. I'm like, this is, we need like one of these a day. Like all the ones I got thrown away, <laughs> there seems to be daily events that would be applicable to your, you know, your brain could quip in. <laughs> And rather than maybe wait six years, we could get a little fragment, oh. like kind of like you that's know the, Pavlov that's dog. The Twitter yeah, conundrum, that, that yeah. The little, not just Twitter, but a, any mm -hmm. anything like the, 
it seems like your brain probably thinks of creative material every single day and well i do have a long rather than wait for a big book like right a little wait bit for of a big book feed us on a little it's basis a, that's it it's a good idea yeah i um i was briefly on twitter for about a month and a half many years ago and it was very much the sort of situation of realizing oh this is a this is a drug that is very fun and very bad for me. Um, because I already feel like uh, I just don't write very long or very much. And the part where if I put it on Twitter, I could just immediately know. It's a little bit like stand-up comedy that way, except more like with more booing. I feel like like maybe more active booing and throwing things and, and right stand up comedy if everyone in the audience was anonymous and behind a screen yes and could yeah and could and could like maybe just throw like daggers through the screen um, so I I um, one night I said to my husband I think I'm gonna quit Twitter and he said in that way that is like a dare you should why don't you and I was like. I will. I'm going to do it right now, in fact. And he was like, great, why don't you? And I was like... D and then, you know, if you ever try to quit Twitter, they, they try to come back at you for a long, long time. They don't believe that you want to quit Twitter, but I, I did quit it. And um, I just didn't tell my publisher or anybody because it was when my book was coming out and they thought I was on Twitter. So uh, another friend of mine who is my age gave me this awesome piece of advice. He said, we're just old enough that we can pretend we don't understand it. And I was like, so when they eventually noticed I wasn't on Twitter and they asked me about it, I was like, oh, I quit it for New Year's. I felt like it was just something I needed to give up and I quit it for New Year's. And they were like, okay. Um, but That's not even a thing. I know. <laughs> yeah, it is. You in the New Year. I guess it was your resolution. Okay. It was it's a not resolution. Like it was, it's not like it was Lent. Well, yeah, but I, yeah, I couldn't have, I couldn't have, I had to, I had to, <laughs> I had to kind of make the timing work, um, but I can I could see that that would be better maybe to put to put little things out. But I sort of don't know what's gonna stay and what's gonna make a story till enough time has passed. So what's gonna happen to that board now that had all those little fragments on it and you used some of them and mm -hmm. you didn't use others? Do you just keep that as like oh this is the board for weather? I'll start a fresh board for the next one, or do you? I mean, there's pluck about off all the ones you used and then save all the rest and think all right. Maybe I can use They have little something. like pencil cross marks by them. Like if I've used them or if I've uh, or if they were just bad, mm -hmm. I put that in. But um, they're behind my um, I know exactly where they are. There's five of them and they're behind my bed and they're all they're all curled up, you know, because they're they had to be smushed mm -hmm. down there. Um, but yeah, when I write another one, I will try. I usually do that at about halfway point of the process when I'm feeling like I might give up. And then somehow if I do something that is not on the computer screen. Um, it turns out it's very satisfying to cut things up. Um, so I cut them up and I put them on boards for a little while and I do it thematically often or by character and then I just walk by it. It's extremely inefficient. I wouldn't recommend it if you're writing your own novel because you could probably finish your novel like three years earlier if you, if you stuck to the write a draft, revise the draft, revise the draft, done, worldwide acclaim. But it's very... <laughs> Rich enough to escape the apocalypse. Yes, yes. Uh, off to buy your New Zealand bolt hole. But it's very satisfying to, as you say, to work with your hands on those things. I mean, it reminds me of like Linda Berry's, the way Linda Berry talks about uh, always keeping the hand moving. Mm -hmm. Always, there's a the direct connection between like the physical activity of creation and the creativity that you always feel like you lose when you're like sitting there staring at the blank screen. Yeah, and that seems valuable. I've always sort of envied like. TV writers who are making what seems like this imaginary thing, but they get to like put up cards on walls right. and like draw lines between them and organize everything. I think I mean I think I probably got the idea like from like watching The Wire and wanting to be one of those people that's like right. I will solve this mystery, you know, and this is connected to this and this is connected to this, and then sometimes you're just wrong, but it looks it looks kind of like it's all going to come together. The more pieces of yarn you put from one thing to another, the crazier you become. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, my, I was at a reading the other night and, and someone asked me a question. Um, she said, well, at what point do you make an outline? Do you take notes and then you make an outline? And I had this memory. You know how sometimes you have a memory and you think, God, I really haven't thought of that in, well, many, many years. And I remembered in high school that we had to write a term paper and we were required 
to show all our note cards and then our outline and then our paper. And I remember very distinctly staying up all night, writing a paper, then writing an outline, mm -hmm. and then writing all these fake note cards that seemed, and I, I was very proud of myself because they were very casual, like I was still working out what right. it would be about. Um, yeah, so. But I admire people that can make outlines of their novels. I feel like it's probably a very, very useful way to write. Uh, I now imagine you taking this novel back home and making the outline for the novel <laughs> and making more note cards. Yeah, exactly. Uh, all right, final question for you. Um, uh, in the book, Lizzie mentions that music really helps her sometimes move past her prepper panic. You talked a lot about music with Parl, uh, about the Velvet Underground, but Lizzie uh, clearly is specifically thinking of a tribe called Quest. So my question for you is, can you kick it? Yes, you can. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Jenny will be signing up here for anyone who wants a book signed. Um, due to coronavirus, please do not touch Jenny. Please do not cough on Jenny. Thank you. Can I have a mask? They don't work. Okay. They don't